but there's really a large majority of people that are involved just for the adventure as well. And um, the camaraderie of, of being with like-minded people, being outdoors, being able to see things a lot of people don't get to see between the bridges. And um, pe people geared towards having a good uh, physical and mental health. Excited to be here. I, I will say before we get started, you know, everybody always asks you why you do these things or, you know, what's the point? And um, really until I dove into your podcast, I didn't know that there was a technical term type two fun. And then since then, I've kind of heard it uh, again and again. So I'm I'm glad to know that there's a lot of people that are like minded that kind of enjoy the things that at the surface, you know, you kind of ask, like, are these people crazy? But uh, in the end, there's a huge community of people that are that are like minded and, and uh, it, it's great to be a part of that. So thanks. Thanks again for having me. I love it. I feel like it's a it's a growing term. And that's what we're trying to do on this podcast is just highlight the people that that check that box. They, they do these insane things and have people on learn from them, kind of inspire myself and inspire others to get out there and, and do some of this stuff. Um, so yes, from there, you know, why don't we just go right into your introduction? Tell us about yourself and how you got into this. Uh, so my name is Wade Binion. I live in College Station, Texas. I'm 45 years old. Uh, my wife Samantha Binion and four young kids, six, eight, ten, and eleven. And uh, my whole family growing up has been kind of uh, outdoorsy and enjoy doing things that um, you know kind of get us out of the house and so my dad and, and us as a family used to go camping out uh, by the san marcus river here in texas and at the canoe livery they had an advertisement for the texas water safari which is a big canoe race down here and so him and a buddy uh, signed up for that while we were quite young still i think they did their first one when i was 10 years old and same thing uh we all thought they were crazy and and this was circa 1995 so you weren't researching it online you weren't uh you know reading articles about what these people had done you weren't studying strava tracks you weren't you weren't doing any of that you were just kind of in for an adventure and so they they did it uh, they finished the first one they started, um, had quite an adventure. It was enough to get them hooked. And uh, this past year, my dad's finished his 32nd race. And um, anyways, naturally kind of got us involved. And uh, I've, I've paddled with my, my dad, my sister, my wife. Um, my nieces and nephews and and then you know my mom and, and wife and others have helped uh, support us on the bank throughout the years as well and so it's really something that i don't think was intentional but has really kind of grown and blossomed into a, a hobby and a, and a family sport for us and um we're, we're still going strong my dad's 72 still paddling i'm paddling uh, my, my sisters uh, still paddle, and all of our friends have really developed from that same community as well. So um, we're, we're trying to branch out and, and do more things and, and do stuff every year, but uh, we, we've really enjoyed it, and I'm um, happy we can continue to be a part of it for as long as we have been. I love it. And maybe for maybe for the the layman, someone who doesn't know about this sport, because I didn't even know this, this existed until I started researching, you know, different and unique events in my state. Can you maybe tell us what what paddle marathoning is? Or how do you what do you even call it? Like ultra <laughs> ultra paddle, ultra canoe, like Yeah, endurance canoe racing, uh ultra marathon, you know, typically anything over hundred miles, they're they're gonna call it an ultra marathon. And um, I, I think maybe jokingly, you know, Texans like to consider themselves kind of tough people. And so I, I'm a lot better at a, at a long distance event than I am at a, at a short, fast event. And so this is a way for people that are 
have a tough mental attitude um, that are persistent and really enduring to paddle. Uh, it can be a canoe, kayak, uh, typically canoes. Um, for the Ensemble Marathon, it's all USCA, United States Canoe Association uh, tandem or two-person canoes. Uh, for all the Triple Crown events, it's, it's all tandem USCA events. Um, USCA boats and uh, you know ultimately it's kind of out of a desire for the ultra endurance events that have become so popular with trail running and mountain biking and uh, ultra triathlons and that sort of thing and so it it probably originated a bit from just the need to get from point A to point B and so as we were no longer dependent on that mode of transportation, it's kind of become more of a recreational event. But, you know, anytime you can have a competition, whether it's throwing quarters or racing canoes, you know, they're always going to find a way to uh, make that a healthy competition. And so ultimately paddling um, has to be human powered only, uh, typically single blade canoe paddles. and in tandem with your partner getting from point a to point b uh, sometimes you have to navigate obstacles uh, dams log jams rapids um, whatever it may be and then you know it's, it's as simple as who can get there the fastest in a lot of that a lot of those scenarios and, and a lot of it is racing um, and, and that really appeals to a, a certain type of crowd but there's really a large majority of people that are involved just for the adventure as well. And um, the camaraderie of, of being with like-minded people, being outdoors, being able to see things a lot of people don't get to see between the bridges and, um, you know, general health, pe people geared towards having a good uh, physical and mental health uh, to go with, with the sport of canoeing. So ho hopefully that covers a little bit of uh, what that means to us and, and what all it involves as far as, um, you know, paddling long distances. Yeah. And now that you're kind of telling some of that, I have fond memories growing up. There's so much water in Michigan. We, we used to go up, up a little bit North and we would always do a family canoe trip. And it was nothing like this where we're going out and, you know, paddling for 50, hundred miles, but we would get together with, I don't know, 50 of my family members all pair up in a, a canoe and just like float down the river, get picked up at the very end of it. Um, and I just have always loved that. We've done that. We've done like the tube tubing where you literally just like sit in a tube, float down the river, drink a bunch of beers and hang out with your buddies. And it's, it's exactly what you're saying. It's, it's a total adventure. It's, it's a blast to go through those like little rapids that you come across, park your canoe on the side of the side of the river bank, do lunch and everything. And, and yeah, that's just like a, a core memory of, of myself growing up. Um, I, and I know you you have four kids now, so this has probably evolved so much since you started this, uh, would you say 30 years ago with your dad? Um, can you maybe explain how, how this has evolved for you and how the sport itself has evolved with all the advances in technologies and canoes and lighting and everything? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep it to a minimum because it, it's really changed quite a bit. Um, you know what, my first water safari, which is our big race here, uh, I did that in 1995. That was my very first one, I was 15. I didn't, I didn't know anything. Uh, we only trained, you know, a little bit leading up to the race. Um, somebody else packed my food. I slept most of the way, I threw up a bunch. Uh, I don't know that I really contributed to the overall speed of the boat much after the first day. And, um, you know, I can't say I particularly enjoyed it or wanted to be there or do it. And I did it again the next year. Uh, voluntold is the term I think they use. And uh, did it again, you know, similarly not a great experience kind of repeated that process for a couple of years. And, and over that time, uh, kind of develop friendships, start to see some of the benefits of doing that, start to appreciate 
the response you get when you tell people you do these things um, to be able to start and finish those things. And then as I evolved uh, both physically and experience wise, it started to become a bit more of a competitive endeavor. You know, once I determined that you can do the distance, because I think that's really the biggest challenge for most people. Um, if you can imagine doing a 5K or, or a road marathon for running, it's very intimidating. So when you hear for like the Asabel being 120 miles, that that's really sometimes can be a barrier to entry to get people comfortable with the idea that you can go that far successfully uh, without just be, having to be medevaced out, you know, for even attempting to do that. So what, for, for me, getting comfortable with being able to, to achieve the goal of starting and finishing those races, developing into a more competitive atmosphere, that, you know, developed over time to where I was able to achieve some of my goals. Uh, in both placing and time. And then, you know, it's it started to evolve as I've had a family too, to where uh, folks are more on career path type goals and then family oriented goals. And uh, for me personally, I, I've been happy to transition a little bit. Um, I don't get to paddle as much as I used to and that's okay but i'm happy to share that with kind of the new generation of, of people in my immediate family and then it also is a great eye awakening eye opening experience to see that you know i was focused on the competitive aspect but you know there's so much more to paddling and canoeing even within these races you you can have a different type of fun in the same event and i think that's really what endears the paddling and racing to the community is you you can have a race within a race you can have your own race you yeah you're within the group but um you know it doesn't just start and end at a, at a certain place you know whether you're first place or fifth place or last place you're paddling just as far and it's your own obstacles you're having to overcome so for me it's really changed from you know, just doing it against my will to learning to appreciate it, to to being able to excel at it. And now it's kind of transitioning to, um, you know, being involved, uh, enjoying some of the finer things, uh, you know, kind of taking in the, the things that are on the periphery a bit more and then sharing those experiences in those those races so you know different partners um traveling to to different events uh going to see different places and using using canoeing and canoe racing as an excuse to go out and meet new people and do do different things so it's it's really given a lot back to me and continues to do so in different ways now than it did in the beginning and in uh, that's really one of the great things about it is whether you're young and inexperienced, uh, young and experienced, fast or slow, uh, young or old, it, it really kind of offers something for everybody, uh, I feel. So, yeah, that, that's in a nutshell my, my personal story, kind of continuing to try to be competitive and get, get finished before the banquet, you know. Um, try to try to finish every race to start, you know, no matter what place. And um, now, you know, trying to enjoy the people as much as the race um, for, for paddling. There's there's a couple things that I want to pull from that. There's I, I, you have four kids and they're a bit older than mine. I have two young kids under four, and it's it's really it's it's wild how like. I want to stay athletic. I want to stay fit for my kids so that I can be a good dad. But I, if I'm doing these endurance events like you are, it's, it is such a time commitment to get out there and train to be able to do 120 miles or 350, like, like we're probably going to dive into later. Um, so you have to like, you have to be diligent and be able to set that, that time aside so that you can actually get out there and train, but still get home and be a good father, be a good husband. And, and, um, uh, 
I just think that's really inspiring and something that I, I find consistently when I'm talking to these, these different guests that I have on here. Um, you, you kind of went through how this has evolved for you over time. And, um, you know, you, you said that it, it's a physical athleticism, but also a very big mental thing. And that's how it was when I did my marathon. It's like, I didn't even think this was possible. And then you go through and you do it once and you're like, huh, should I do it again? That was, that kind of sucked. The training was pretty brutal, but there's, there's all these longer events and there's all these events around the world. There's so many guests that I have on that actually travel like yourself to, to do these events. And that's, that's almost an excuse to, to, you know, stay healthy, go see new places. And you kind of let that hobby dictate where you're going next with your family to, to kind of see the world. Um, going back to that a little bit, you were doing this, you know, 30 years ago and back then they did not have all this GPS technology. They did not have, um, you know, the lights when you're doing these races, you are riding in the daytime and through the night and you still have to be able to navigate these waters, whether there's rapids, rocks, logs or whatever. Um, what was that like way back when? And how did you, you know, how did you do all that without getting hurt? Yeah, it I'm lost. <laughs> it's funny because a lot of times you would show up at check in and you would see these wild variations of paddles and boat setups and gear and people just kind of inventing stuff in their garages. And you would see a lot of things that you, you knew weren't going to work because somebody else had tried it. Like, yeah, I, I've seen that before. It doesn't work. But there, there was no repository of information to say, okay, wearing blue jeans in a canoe is a bad idea, you know. Um, maybe the opposite way you know you'd see people with no shirt and you'd be like that's a bad idea i, I know you think a shirt's hot but you got to keep the sun off and you you would see these wild examples of people trying to learn you know real time and you would see the same thing with um the getting lost part you know people taking wrong turns and there would always be a speech about like the river goes downstream like just stay in the current like you cannot go wrong the the river's got to go somewhere how can you get lost if you just stay in the river and uh same with nutrition uh, a lot of people would be making a lot of their own endurance race fuel they're they're whatever they're going to eat and drink trying to make something really calorie dense uh something that doesn't weigh a lot when you're having to take it with you and something that's easy on your stomach, uh, something you want to eat, and and not something that's the same thing at hour one as it is at hour twenty, to where you you're just even if you love it, even if it's the best thing in the world, if you get sick uh, and you just can't take it anymore, what else are you gonna have? And th there was always a wide variety of peanut butter and jellies, cake icing, uh, power bars. Uh, maltodextrin, you know, Kool-Aid, you name it. And so you would always see, you know, what works best for these people. And it was always a challenge to try to figure those things out. And a lot of that still happens today, but there's so many resources, so many manufacturers, so many brands, so many off the shelf options that rarely are you having to uh, make your own granola bars uh, for the race like you used to back then. Um, same with the paddles and stuff um you know when i started we used to use for, for the races back home flat blade double blade paddles so so just flat on the ends well now they have wing blade paddles nobody uses flat blades anymore uh used to see a, a pretty healthy variation of kevlar and carbon canoes now it's primarily carbon you, you don't find too many kevlar canoes um all the paddles uh composite foam core you know paddles They're, everybody's using the same ones and and before it used to be a, quite a mix um same same with the gps the same with the lights you know you're having to make your own lights um you, you would really hear a lot of wild stories about light malfunctions uh batteries catching on fire because they were incorrectly uh, put together in series 
uh, water intrusion. Uh, a lot of them were one-off usage because you didn't have rechargeable batteries. And now with lithium batteries, uh, LID bulbs, HID bulbs, um, the the duration that they last, the the power of the lights, you know, they don't dim the way they used to. You don't have like the small orange bulb. Uh, it it's really changed, and it it's almost a testament as well to the uh, accessory endurance events so bike racing a lot of times you know they have a lot of crossover products that you can use for mountain bike racing um same with the trail running with the nutrition and then even the athletic wear you know you would have to kind of find a pseudo athletic shirt and kind of make it your own now you know they don't sew the seams like standard shirts you know a lot of your athletic shirts will have the seams so that they don't rub you so bad um we used to get like women's tights to wear for leggings to help to keep the sun off well now they make athletic tights for men and women for outdoors you know that you see basketball players wearing uh ultra runners wearing you know a lot of those things you were just trying to make fit your your sport which in this case is is paddling and so um, nowadays, you, you don't. It's it's really been a benefit because you don't see the the misery in learning that, hey, this this seat foam doesn't work. Um, you know, you you would see people pulling out couch cushion foam to use. Um, the seat designs have changed to where they're they're kind of. Well, there's got to be a comfortable way. There's got to be a more a better option for a canoe seat that that doesn't hurt my butt. Well, not really. Okay, you know, it's, you're suffering the same as everybody else. Now, what's the, what's the key? Okay, well, the key is to get it dialed in to to you, and you know, all those things have really changed, like technology has for everything else. But um, for as simple as a sport, as basic as a sport as canoeing is, you know, human powered only two paddles in a canoe. Um, there's always kind of an effort to incentivize your speed and your performance with technology. And uh, m maybe the same way that the most basic of all sports running, you know, is really developed with the shoe design and the watches and, and the clothing. Uh, paddling is, is kind of followed suit as will tend to be and I, you know i don't i'm not smart enough to know what the next best thing's going to be but there's lots of people out there that are very enthusiastic about paddling they're always looking for the for the next thing whether that's the composite material to make the boats out of or the design um i'm, I'm always as interested as anybody and i think that's a common thread through any of these races that you know you huddle around the campfire and you know what's what's the new greatest thing and try to look over at the guy next to you and see what he's got in his boat and what kind of cushion and what kind of seat set up and what kind of foot brace and uh you know see if there's anything to be gained and you know a lot of times it's small but uh it's always a fun exercise to uh look at the new the the change in the new and most latest greatest type thing so yeah and i feel like when you're talking about all this gear it it makes these sports so much more approachable because you can go online and kind of ease your fears ease your anxieties by you know knowing what lights work and knowing what canoe you need to get and then you just have to train your body and your mind to be able to get through the, the pain of well, however long you're going for and i think that does make it makes a lot of this stuff more approachable and it makes it so that people can get involved and compete in this stuff, which which I think is great because I don't know, I, I wouldn't have even known about this if I hadn't have been crossing through town. Uh, I could just look on the internet and find out about it and you know connect with you and learn about it through this way. Um, and if, if you're watching the if you're watching the the video of this, uh, Wade's got all these trophies on his wall. He just walked around his house and showed me all these different trophies that he's done or that he has from all these different events. Um, so like 
from that, like, why don't you tell us about some of the, the cooler events you've done and where paddling has taken you? Yeah, the, the Texas Water Safari is kind of my home race, if you will. And that, that's kind of our big event here. Uh, that's 260 miles uh, from San Marcos, Texas, which is kind of in the center. There's some natural springs that pop up just from the ground. There's an aquifer there. Some of the oldest uh, Native American inhabited areas, and the river starts right there, just semicircle of concrete, and it goes downstream from there. Goes all the way to the coast, um, 260 miles, finishes in the Gulf of Mexico, and um, I've, I've done that one 27 times. Um, team captain twice, and of course we had a COVID year, so so 30 years I've been involved with that, and um, my my dad got me in that one. Um, I just got my Iron Paddler Award this year for the Osable River Canoe Marathon, so that's that's 10 finishes. Uh, did did that one, my first one up there in 1999. Uh, did didn't know anything, <laughs> just just kind of went up there and did it uh, with my dad. Had a same thing, you know. Kind of hard to say if you enjoyed it at the time, but obviously it's been back and uh, really enjoy that. Um, being in Texas, uh, went further south, uh, down to Belize, uh, La Ruta Maya Belize River Challenge. They have an annual race down there. That's a stage race across four days. Um, starts almost at the border of Guatemala and then travels down to the Caribbean coast. And that's, I've, I've done that probably five or six times and, uh, team captain a time or two really some great paddlers down there in a, in a great atmosphere and then um went with another local texas paddler to england and did the devices uh race dw uh same thing it's a it's a continuous race but it's all the portages that they have um i think they have 75 portages across uh the 100 100 plus mile race uh just did that once but you know we had ice on the deck and you paddle by windsor castle and you you know get get to see the country and uh finish over there by the uh westminster abbey so that, that's really cool and then um got a chance to do the yukon river quest a couple times so that, that's in yukon territory um 400 60 miles like 700 kilometers and that's a it's a continuous race but they have mandatory layovers so they have a seven hour mandatory layover and a three hour mandatory layover um did that team captain once for that and, and raced three times uh, all on team boats voyager boats they call them uh, ne never tandem or individually and then uh raced in missouri on the mr340 uh from kansas city to st louis just a little bit short of st louis and uh did that twice in a team boat and then have helped actually got a chance to help team captain for the very first one they had for that so that, that was kind of neat i haven't been back it's really kind of a different race um their participation is growing every year it's, it's really a good time um and then you know within the us uh, i've got a chance to do the run of the charles out there in boston and uh the des plains river canoe marathon uh, in chicago um got a chance to do usca nationals in warren in pennsylvania um got a chance to to do the tour de tesh which is in louisiana that's a four-day race it's over uh, 100 plus miles that finishes in the gulf of mexico as well and then um you know we've had tons of little races here in texas that really is is a chance to kind of get out and do that so even the local races here are a good excuse to travel within the state and then yeah those those are pretty much all the big ones that i've hit out and about uh each one's unique I, i'm really glad to have had a chance to do all of those with the kids it's getting harder to get out and do more 
but I, I strongly encourage anybody to get out and do as many as you can to see other communities, other rivers, other race types, um, uh, other boats, and really different environments for those things. So had a great time. Like to continue to keep doing more, and uh, I, I hope I can. It's it's not as frequent as it used to be, which which is understandable. But um, th those are a few. That's cool. I th I think when we were talking in our pre-call, you said that the Missouri one is the is that the world's longest race. No, that's the Yukon race. They uh, Yukon River Quest. So they they had that race um, again. It, the river moves so fast the, the elevation change really the rate of speed on the river uh you know 12 miles an hour or something and they had that race for a while what they had one of the race committee members decide to put on a non-stop race that's quite a bit longer and so it actually is not not the longest anymore uh it was for a while but but technically they do have a few and then they've started a new race in alabama 650 miles uh my sister did that one a couple years ago and you know you're talking multiple days uh to get through that um it's obviously a, a lot closer to sea level so the elevation change isn't you know the river's not quite as fast there um my dad and quite a few people they still have an everglades challenge which is um like around the peninsula of florida they've they have some that are they're all pretty long in their own right you know some some are technically longer but some are longer um for race times kind of depending on how how it goes for you you mentioned portaging and i think that's something that's that you should explain to the listeners and and kind of i'd like to understand how that works because uh you you have all these dams and these obstacles you have to get around and i'm assuming that's a whole process to just kind of get to the shore get get that that canoe picked up and waddled over to the the next side yeah you know ultimately when you're trying to get from point a to point b uh, you know the river is is a natural resource, and it's it's always got tree limbs or trees or rocks or kind of man made obstacles like the hydroelectric dams or low head dams, and um, and and even sometimes it's just a dangerous situation where you don't want to be in the river and you just want to portage around, and on the rare occasions sometimes it's quicker you know to to cut the corner and and portage over and go across. And so, you know, anytime you're racing, you you're want to reduce your weight profile of your your boat and your equipment. And so you're trying to run as lean as you can to kind of help you not have to carry as much extra weight as you can. So anytime you're portage in the boat, you know, that's really gonna be a slower time. So you you want to make that happen as fast as you can in texas a lot of times we'll drag the canoe it'll be so heavy and the boats are designed that you can just pull it on the ground and and get both people up front and just let the stern drag for, for events like triple crown events uh the Hasabel river canoe marathon the la classique the general clinton canoe regatta um you you're usually going to have the boats are are fragile enough you're going to have one person on the front one person on the back and obviously the faster you can get done the better so you see those guys running full speed guys and gals i should say and you know there's a, a real technique involved with as soon as you get out of the boat dump any excess water dump extra food dump extra jugs um, or do you leave them in and you just run and you let your team captain pull them out or do you put the baler down and let the water drain out as you're running and then I know I've been involved in a couple times where you run full blast fast as you can from point A to point B to get your portage done and you get in the water and you're dead. And the guys that were jogging behind you put in and then they pass you on the water because they didn't, you know, max out on their on their cardiovascular on the run. And so, you know, how far are you having to go? Try to pace yourself a little bit. Uh, there's also a lot of strategy and 
you know, hey, let's paddle up ahead, let's get out fast, and then there's only room, there's only enough room for one or two boats. Maybe there's only enough room for one. So sooner you can get there, if you can get there ahead of the other guy, they've got to wait for you to get out. If you can get to the put in before the other person, then you're kind of in, not in control of the situation, but you can kind of, hey, we can get our stuff. Um, you know, there's no chance they're going to put in ahead of us and leave. We're going to make sure that we can observe what's going on and, and kind of keep track of anybody we're racing against. Um, and then a lot of times, too, when you're trying to communicate with your team support, you know, if, if you're doing that on the portage, that's when they've got the most time to chat with you and kind of see how you're doing, get a feel for your condition, you know, what kind of shape you're in, what you might need. And so those portages are, are really multifaceted. And if you're riding with a team and they have a good portage and you don't, you're going to have to work really hard to catch back up. And then, you know, vice versa, if you can really be efficient, just like any transition and any, you know, T1, T2 type thing, in and out as fast as you can, uh, take care of your business. And then, you know, in an alternate scenario, if you have something you need to do, boat repair, uh, refuel, uh, resupply, you know, and to take a minute, like, hey, let's let's figure out what's wrong with this seat slider. You know, we're not able to move back and forth. My foot brace is broken. Like, that's the place to do it not out in the middle of a pond, out in the middle of the river, you know, away from everybody. Uh, sometimes if you're in those those portage situations, that's really a great chance to uh, remedy, you know, any problems you might have. Dead batteries on your lights, um, change, change of clothes, an extra jacket, something like that. And so if, if you're, maybe to expand on that a little bit, you know, if you're, if you're portaging at a random location and not a designated portage spot, you know, you're trying to figure out where's the best place to get out. Where's the best place to get in? Do I go a little bit further down for a little bit easier access or do I put in right here so I can get going again? Um, do I take out further upstream at a little gentler exit or do I go up all the way to the obstruction and try to, um, you know, really crawl through the mud to get out and go around? And it, you know, here at home, in a lot of places, you'll have obstacles that are in the water that, okay, do I just stay in the river and just try to go right up and over, or do I try to go around? And some of that comes with experience. You're going to get over your obstacle. You're going to portage the, the obstacle. But if you can have some thought into it, or if you know what you're getting into, it can really increase efficiency. And so you're not like, well, let's go to this side and see if there's a good get out over there well it looks like it's better on the other side so you can really waste a lot of time if you don't have you know your ducks in a row on, on those things it's funny you you talked about the endurance involved in the, the portaging because when i'm thinking about this i'm i'm thinking about my my running experience or, or biking or whatever you're always using your legs you kind of ignore your upper body but you are going these long stints of time where you're just rowing nonstop, working your upper body, and then you have to, you still have to, you know, lift the lift the canoe up to get it around there. But then you're you're using all your legs to carry your heavy ass equipment around this and to get it back in the water. So you really are kind of working your whole body throughout the the span of that. I, I would have to imagine you have to do a lot of weight training to train for some of these and make sure every muscle in your body is ready for it. You've never felt a light boat feel so heavy as when you've paddled as hard as you can and then try to get out. And you're like, I know this thing weighs the same as it did when I got it off the car, but it feels like a million pounds. And uh, yeah, that that's true. You know, I, oh, we, we must have a hole in the boat. You know, this this thing must be holding water. No, it's it's not. You're you're just fatigued. You know. And uh, yeah, to to your point there are a lot of people that are a lot stronger that finish further back because they don't have the proper muscles conditions for the event um there's a lot of people that are not as strong but that are more efficient that that do really well there's a lot of people that are both physically and technically faster 
that don't pace themselves well that end up falling back. Same for nutrition. You can be as athletic and in shape as you want to be. Uh, you see this like in the Tour de France all the time. Uh, people have a bad day. They, they didn't hydrate properly, uh, didn't have their calorie intake proper. Um, you see that a lot to where people are really in great shape. They feel like they've got all their bases covered and, you know, something does, doesn't work. And so, and so uh, you know, typically the fastest team usually wins, but a lot of times they don't. And you have a lot of newcomers that come in that are crossing over and they say, hey, I'm I'm a great runner. I'm a great track and field athlete, uh, played college football, um, you know, always been athletic, biking, you know, something like that. And it's not the same. It, it, there's a huge component with technique involved. And that's why you can see a lot of people that are older still be competitive uh, in, in a sport like canoeing because, um, you know, they, they really learn the finer points. And it's not all physical. You know, it's it's really as much a mental game and a maintenance and, and a taking care of yourself as it is um, just being able to paddle and move your arms faster than the next guy, you know. You kind of you hinted at this a little bit. You you were team captain for a while, and it sounds like the major role of that is you're you're guiding your your team through everything. But you are the primary resource for, um, you know, for your teams probably while they're going down the river, but also on their portages. Like when you have those portage events, what's all going into those resupplies? Like that's your chance to get different gear. You know, resupply your food toss your garbage like what else is going into all that yeah that that's a loaded question that's a whole episode unto itself um i i will say that uh yeah up there in michigan they call them feeders in in texas we talk, call them team captains um you you support your pit crew you know they go by different names i would say ideally you've got 90 percent of that worked out before the race even starts you know, hey, what are you going to want at this spot? What are you going to want at this next spot? You know, what uh, what are some options I can have for you? And um, you're really trying to cover up a lot of things in a really short period of time, trying to assess their physical uh, abilities, where they're at fatigue-wise, um, if they have any special requests, uh, medicine wise, you know, upset stomach, uh, blisters. And then you're also trying to feed them as much information as you can. You know, how far ahead's the next team, how far behind, you know, what kind of pace you're on. Uh, you know, if the river's up, uh, thunderstorms coming, anything you can kind of think of, that's really your chance to relay that information and for you to assess what they need. Now, the problem is that time is so short. So your team comes in and they have some sort of special request, uh, Pepto-Bismol or Tums or aspirin. If you don't have it, you, you really can't solve that problem, ideally, in the time that you have. Now, in extreme circumstances, that's where you need to decide, you know, hey, let's we need to get right. We need to, you know, get some extra hydration. We need to get some extra nutrition, uh, some sort of, you know, stomach relief, whatever. And, you know, you need to spend the time there for them to get what you need. But usually it's bare minimum. It's, it's here, you, here you come, there you go. Uh, here's what we had pre-programmed for this location and uh, hope you like it. If not, tell me. And what what I tend to do is set it up for the next spot. Okay, so we're pulling in. We're getting what we need. I've got an issue. Please have an extra light ready at the next stop. Uh, hey, broke a paddle. Please have an ex a paddle ready at the next spot. And I'm, I'm not trying to solve it all right there. I'm trying to keep my efficient 
my efficiency through those stops with you know some sort of planning that says if i need something we're going to have it in the truck car vehicle and then i'll ask for it and then you get it to me at the next spot so i know when you're going to have it for me and you know what to have for me when we get there and and really kind of having some sort of plan and then you know i'm telling you my story but you know some people are yelling uh some people are are you know just irate at what they need they need it now they expect you to have everything and then some people are just like hey don't worry about it you're doing a great job you know you can do no wrong it it's really hopefully the latter but um, you you do get all types and i think that that answered my other question where you are not talking to these people via radio or anything while you're out there on the river so you only really have that short period of time while you're doing that portage to fill them in on the information you need so they can get it to you then or um is that that's pretty accurate if you want to have a conversation about the things you tell or don't tell your team that that could fill a chapter in a book as well you know do you, do you let them know they're getting caught or do you just say hey they're obviously feeling bad and they need to recoup if if i tell them x then you know one of the big things i know for me is you, you don't want to lie to your team you, you don't want to tell them you're catching the next team you don't want to tell them you know you're doing good you you want to be honest uh, good good or bad whether they want to hear it or not you know hey you guys are slowing down uh, if you're slowing down you're slowing down um you know if you, you don't want to try to trick anybody or or try to say anything that's really outside of of actuality and and it does happen sometimes where your intentions are are good you know, hey, maybe if I tell them there's another team right up there, they'll push and, uh, you know, maybe they can catch them or something. And then it turns out they push themselves into exhaustion and you were just trying to help. But you, you don't know what's going on all the time between checkpoints. And so it it can be contentious to say, you know, what what do we do? And you know i really try to stray away from making decisions for the paddlers you know on the bank because you you don't know what they're going through you, you may think you know and you you may have some idea but you know you guys need to keep going no we need to rest you know we need to stop you know we're not feeling good you know you, you try to encourage them the best you can and uh, you know ultimately you've got a relationship with those people that is conducive to making the best decision for everybody and sharing you know the information that helps them the most um and and overwhelmingly it's a positive you know hey you know we got ice cream for you at the next spot hey so and so is going to be there to see you um you guys are doing great and that's really a, a pretty common theme that's cool there's it seems like that is similar to other endurance races where you have your your random stops or random spots where you can refill and kind of you know get motivated from your team or your support crew and whatnot um i, I want to i want to go into the salvo river marathon a little bit just because that's that's local to me that's kind of how, how i found you uh they dubbed this the world's toughest spectator sport and when you when you look at this event it's it's kind of wild i mean you start on a street, you got hundreds, thousands, I don't know how many uh, canoes all lined up. You pick this thing up and you storm down down the road until you get to your dock end point. And there's like thousands of people, local people watching this event go off. Um, and it, it's just like a total sight to see. I, your video that I saw was actually really, really cool. Just kind of seeing you running alongside all the different canoers and the amount of people that come out to watch that thing and the amount of people that come from around the world to attend this thing you come from texas up to michigan and i know that you you mentioned there's people from around the world that show up to this um can you maybe shed some light on the uniqueness of that event and and like what it means to be the world's toughest spectator sport yeah um you know gopro 
has really come out with some great cameras and, and some great attachments and you know they're waterproof and all that sort of thing and um i've i've enjoyed filming paddling and that sort of thing and the osable river canoe marathon is really a great event to be able to capture on those videos because it is such a um exciting event that really translates well on the camera um this year they had just under 100 teams last year they had a record with uh maybe 106 teams so so typically it's it's under 100 teams but they're continuing to grow and the amount of support they have from the community along the way and the paddling community not not just the local um you know residential community but also you know the the people that commute in to to be enjoy the river and the the atmosphere and so um they the race itself has really done a lot to um cultivate an exciting event and and they do that with a lot of a lot of different things one of them is just paddler support you know for the athletes themselves they really do a great job of you know promoting the event you know getting the word out they do a great job of um, organizing the event you know with the banners and the locale you know getting the street organized and painted and the flyers and brochures to illustrate hey these are the points these are the times that people are going to be there uh they've also got a great radio uh community i guess you call it to where you can listen to the race online you can listen to the race online so basically wherever you live and then just like we talked about with technology you can follow the race online with uh, now the boats carry spot trackers where you can kind of watch uh, real time. And then they've also got a results page that has live updates at the timing locations that has split information. As they're going through, you can see where they're at, how many places they moved up, moved down, their point to point times or overall times, and then their projected times for the next next finishes. So it's really conducive to being an enjoyable event for the spectators with all the things that they do to help make that happen. In addition to that, I would say just the level of competition makes it exciting to watch and be a part of is all of the boats for the Osable are standardized in their design. So they all have to be certain length, certain width. They all undergo a jigging process um, to, to make sure they fall within those, uh, just like NASCAR. They're, so all the boats are the same. Now it's really just a competition amongst the people, right? So it's, it's just you versus me. It's not an advantage you have uh, with your boat. And now there are different boat designs, but generally speaking, you know, they've really made it a person versus person event instead of a technology versus technology event, even though we've touched on that a little bit. And so the crowd support that they get up there is really second to none uh, as far as what we do, as far as USCA C2 paddling. And, uh, and, and it's, it's such a great environment too. If you get a chance to visit the area, you know, the, the national forest, uh, the different towns, the boat ramps. It's it's really a great, great environment that really helps develop um, an appreciative atmosphere for spectators, the fans, and, and all the paddlers that get to do it that kind of benefit from that support, uh, both directly and indirectly. I love that. There's When you look at that site, they have other i wouldn't say local but they have they have three events that make up this triple crown is what they call it and you've hinted at it a few times i'm finding with a lot of other sports they 
it's it's a total feat to compete complete one of these and then they pair them with with a few others like the the world marathon majors they have six of them around the world that people compete in if, if you achieve all those and you get this nice medal you you get added to a a list that says you traveled the world and and competed in all these marathons um so yeah they have they have this triple crown which is the Salvador Rubo marathon and two others i believe that you've done that and you're you're added to that hall of fame for that event um what are those other two events uh the Lac Classic de Canots in uh, Canada, in Quebec, Canada, is um, also a similar style race. It's a stage race, uh, so it's a little bit different. It, it's not a non-stop race. Uh, and the General Clinton Canoe Regatta in Bainbridge, New York, uh, which is non-stop uh, as well. And it, it's 70 miles. I forget the exact distance of the Classic all similar boat designs um all similar racing environments and uh they all have prize money for competitions uh the the general clinton in new york has kind of a um uh, uh, they've got lots of different races over the different days um they they kind of have a festival type atmosphere is the word i was looking for where it's not singularly focused on one race. Uh, the Classic is singularly focused on the one event, but by having it over multiple days, you know, kind of starting and stopping at different locations, uh, they, they've really had, you know, a big time kind of having celebrations at each location. And um, the, the competitors that compete in those are, are generally the same. You know, there's it encourages a lot of crossover uh, and participation in multiple events if if you've already been training uh, you enjoy doing that sort of thing it gives you an opportunity to uh, do more than just one event for the year as far as a, a major event and they're also spaced out uh, the general clinton's in may um, the ensemble is last weekend in july and then the La Classique is in uh, usually Labor Day weekend, September. And so that that's kind of a good way to bookend your season is, is to have the General Clinton, which occurs first, uh, really get ramped up and have that shoot for, and then kind of, uh, you know, dial in your training and, and hit the Osable Marathon. And then, you know, if, if you're still looking to reach your goals or, or just want a, a chance to go see another location and be involved or, you know, that's just your thing, then it gives you a chance to travel and, and go see a different part of the world and, and be involved in another great race uh, in Canada and Quebec. Very cool. So I always, I always try to leave time towards the end of the episode to allow the, the guests to, you know, tell a type two fun story and, and I, it sounds like you've done so much. So is there any that come to mind that you think would be worth sharing with the listeners? Oh, I don't know. You know, a lot of those stories are funny to me, but they're, they're not always funny to other people. Um, I, I will say one story that I like to share uh, about the ensemble that, that you may enjoy is when we had some people there and, you know, you talk about the race support, they would always mail us. Um, you know, you, you had to kind of inquire, or if you were going to enter, it was a mail-in entry, you know, it was kind of pre, pre-internet. pre And so at that time in 99, when we were going to enter, uh, they still had an amateur division and they had an expert division. And we had been paddling in Texas for a little while and we kind of thought we knew, you know, what we were doing. And so it came time to send in our entry and um, I, I kind of wanted to do amateur i said well we've never been up there and and dad was like well you know we've been paddling a lot we're we're experts you know so we entered the expert division and uh we went up there and we borrowed a boat and the the boat had a big stick in the middle of it from the the central center stanchion and i said we don't need that stick and i pulled that stick out and we went to jig our boat and we had a big hog in the bottom of it and they said you can't have that I said, okay, let me go grab that stick, put it 
back in there. So that stick was in there to shove to keep the bottom straight, which we realized. And they didn't give us a hard time because they knew we weren't going to win anything. All that to be said, we do the race and we go and we thought we were going to catch them the next day. We said, oh, those guys are paddling too fast. We're going to catch them in the morning. We ended up finishing second to last. We, we beat one boat. And um, every amateur that entered beat us in. <laughs> so uh, in hindsight, um, even in an amateur level, we could have uh, really, really got humbled on that first trip up there. And so that that's kind of a fun story that uh, I like to tell a lot is, yeah, we we thought we were experts and uh, that's not the case. So. So you had to mail this thing in. This is, you know, pre-internet. How did you even, one, hear about it? And two, there would have been like no way for you to even know what the times people were getting from previous years. So we we looked in the brochure and the brochure says okay this is about the time to expect the leaders to arrive and the water level up there is really consistent uh, it can vary but typically the people are getting there you know within a few minutes of when they're expected so we saw those times in the brochure and we said okay it takes them an hour 45 to get from point a to point b and we wrote these times on a piece of duct tape and we put them on our boat and we said, okay, I, I don't even know what the name of this bridge is, you know, like that's how little we knew, but we had the times. So, okay, where are we at? And they'd say, okay, you're at Stefan's bridge. Okay. We'd look at our little handmade handwritten timesheet that was duct tape in the boat. Okay. You know, we got 45 minutes to the next spot. 45 minutes would come and go and uh we were so slow and those those times were like for the leaders you know like top five boats should be here you know within this time and we were like double you know what what those times were um but we we had no idea you know we'd get to the ponds and uh some of those finishing ponds you know cook and foot and they, they can be quite long and uh you know we, we got an hour 45 written on here Ooh, we were out there forever we, we had no idea and so we would just go we would just go out in those ponds and we didn't know where we were going we didn't pre-gps and so we would just look for the power lines because we figured it's a hydroelectric dam generate electricity there's got to be some power lines and so we would look we would just paddle and then look for the lines and then to be, to be looking for you know wherever we were supposed to go and uh you know we we would portage and and go down and then it wasn't until you know like weeks later uh my aunt or somebody had some handheld camcorder footage and we're like where were all those people you know like my old dam was just full of people when we got there they were just, they were picking up the cones behind us you know <laughs> it was a very different race than uh what what everybody else was seeing so yeah it's it's certainly changed um we used to have uh wayne and marcia copa used to mail us an entry form every year even if we you know even if we weren't going they would say hey we're we're mailing you an inch we're keeping you on the the distribution list you know and we always enjoyed that because even though we weren't going to go, we just kind of, yep, like Christmas cards, you know, we knew we were getting an entry invite and always appreciated that. So I bet it's even more hard to kind of estimate timing because you have no idea how quick the river is going to be. And if you do, you don't know what the water level is going to be at any given time. So those estimates are just totally off base and very hard to even keep up with. I think it speaks more to our naivety than it does the the times, you know, like, oh, uh, you know, here's here's a brochure with some times in it. That's got to apply to us, you know, and we've kind of were like, well, that's the time. And I, I don't know that we thought we were going to be going as fast as the leaders, but like we weren't putting two and two together, like how much faster they were than we were. 
and uh, you know, if you know where you're going and if you've been training and if you're in good shape, this is approximate time. If you don't know where you're going, if you're from Texas and you're not really that fast, uh, then yes, that's that's on a very different timetable. Very cool. Now, is there any uh, shout outs, shout outs, or send offs, or anything you wanna you wanna? Uh, is there any shout outs you wanna give before we we wrap things up? Yeah, there there is actually. Um, I've I've got a couple. Um, you know, my my wife supports me and and the kids, and uh, she got a chance to race some this year, and her and I raced a marathon together a couple years ago, and that was really great. Um, you know, my, my dad and I raced a marathon, uh, my sister raced this past year, um, while I was racing as well. And so I've, I've really, you know, kind of thank everybody in, in my immediate family and extended family that, that have had a chance to, to paddle and race. Um, there is a paddler from, from Michigan that, that passed away uh, a couple years ago, uh, or just, just not that long ago, uh, Nick Walton, he came down and raced, uh, in texas and and he is kind of a an ensemble you know I'll, I'll call him a legend you know he lots of uh second place a couple times um lots of finish just a super tough competitor and you know i really enjoyed racing with him in texas and so every time i get a chance to talk about the marathon and the safari you know, he, he was somebody that I, I try to remember and, you know, um, you know, we, we had some, we, we had good, good times. He, he was super competitive and, uh, you know, if, if you ever get to hear any stories about Nick, uh, you know, please just, just ask everybody loved him as a person and everything. So, um, that, that's probably the only thing I, I thought to mention is, you know, there's there's a lot of great people up in the paddling community, kind of wherever you go. It's it's the same people. They're really great. Um, the people at home are the same as the people up there. And and when you go from state to state or uh, country to country, it's really a kindred spirit that that brings their body together. And um, you know, I, I I couldn't be happier to be part of the community. To have my family be part of the community and, and then hopefully uh you know my kids say they want to paddle they say they want to race and uh, i say well i don't <laughs> i don't want to push them because I, I want them to enjoy it and and hopefully make it a positive environment for them so i'm, I'm really thankful for the people um you know tr try to shout out to the people you know we we try to remember uh in the paddling community and and immediate friends and family so yeah kind of a broad brush you know, uh, just giving thanks for all the people we get to be around. Yeah, that community aspect is is something that is that just carries between all these different hobbies and sports that we talk about here. Uh, Wade, this was really good. I I learned a lot. I liked. Uh, I really liked hearing about the some of the strategies and the different races you've done. You know, these these portages and the refueling stations that you got going on. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. I hope you had a good time and thanks for kind of sharing your tale and, you know, sh sharing about this, this world that most people don't even know about. Oh, no, thanks. Thanks for having me on Tyler. I, it, it's such a small community. It's such a niche sport that, you know, if somebody wants to talk about paddling, I, I tell them you better have a block of time because I enjoy talking about it and happy. And, and hopefully this, uh, you know, encourages people outside of the sport to look into it and and get involved and hopefully participate in some day and uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to share that message thanks for listening if you want to hear more type 2 fun adventures check out this playlist on your screen